Hello and welcome to CBC Toronto's mayoral debate. We are live from the Canadian Broadcasting Centre and a special welcome to you if you're listening on CBC Radio and CBC Listen. I'm Maravel Tarouk, host of CBC Toronto News at 6. Okay, everyone, there's less than three weeks to go before Election Day. So today, we have brought together five people who are all vying for Toronto's top job. Former Scarborough MPP Mitzi Hunter is with us today. Welcome, Mitzi. Thank you for having me. City Councillor Josh Matlow joins us too. Hi, Josh. Hi, nice to be here. Thanks for being here. A former former councillor and MP Olivia Chow is also here. Welcome, Olivia. Good day. Former Toronto Police Chief Mark Saunders sitting next to Olivia. Hello. Good morning. And finally, we've got former City Councillor Anna Bailao. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. We have also invited, I should note, uh, candidate Brad Bradford, but he and his wife have just welcomed a new baby, so they're taking a bit of a break from the campaign trail. All right, on to today's business. We've divided up our conversation today into three parts. We're going to start with some questions on housing, and then our municipal affairs reporter, Sean Jeffords, will join us for part two. Sean's going to have questions based on his reporting on the candidates and their campaigns. Our final segment will be questions about the state of our city and the solutions the candidates have proposed in their platforms. Sprinkled in between, we'll try to give you a chance to get to know the candidates beyond their platforms, as people, as Torontonians. Before we begin, some ground rules to explain to our audience and for the candidates in this first segment. If during your answer you make a claim about one of your opponents uh, and directly by name, we will give that candidate an opportunity to respond. Though please try to limit it and, and try to stick to the time that you're given uh, because if you do, that leaves us with some time for fun questions like the one we're going to kick things off with. You have a friend visiting from out of town. What is the one thing they must do while they are in our beautiful city? And you have 20 seconds each to answer this question. Mitzi Hunter, let's start with you. Okay, well, of course, uh, I'm from Scarborough, so let's take a walk on the Scarborough Bluffs and just really enjoy <clears throat> the beautiful natural beach um, and beautiful water. And then, of course, maybe we'll just swing by twice as nice on Kingston Road and have some jerk chicken, uh, very authentic. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll just hop on the subway, come downtown. Um, you know, you've got to see the heart of our city, the art, the culture, and the vibrancy. Um, that's, that's my visit. <laughs> That's my visit. Mitzi, That's you got visit. a whole list there for us. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, next, let's go to Mark Saunders. 20 seconds. What's the one thing your guests must do? Well, great, and thanks for asking. You know, uh, I spent most of my time living in Toronto in the West End, and Hyde Park is beautiful, and especially during cherry blossom season. But also, it's family-friendly, too, because you have the zoo. So uh, I love Hyde Park. I uh, spent a lot of time there, and that is always a spot that I'd like to take someone. All right. Thank you, Mark Saunders. Olivia Chow, 20 seconds for you. Come down to the ferry dock at the foot of Bay Street and take a beautiful ferry ride to the Toronto Islands and rent a bike, rent a canoe, and just hang out. It's a beautiful place, especially in the summer. Bring okay. your kids, too. Okay. All right. Um, Josh Matlow, well, the one thing your guest must do while they're here. I, along with the urban vitality that we have, I would want to take them through our ravine system. Uh, you can walk through every part of our city going through our remarkable ravines, get right down to the waterfront as well, and just pop out in a, in a random neighborhood and experience the local restaurants and community. All right. Final candidate for this question, Anna Bailao. What is the one thing you'd want your guests to do? So I have a lot of experience on this. I've had lots of family coming to visit and friends coming to visit. So one must is always the CN Tower. I think that's the symbol that we all have. I had back home when my family was going back, take to the CN Tower. But I always like to take them on a hike to Scarborough Bluffs because it they're, they're so surprised to see something like that in a large city like Toronto. And, uh, and they're always amazed uh, with, uh, with the Scarborough Bluffs. And a hike is always very enjoyable there. There we go. Get outside. I think everyone's like ready to get summer going, too, it sounds like. Thank you all, candidates, for those suggestions. Now, one thing uh, also that candidates agree on, 
is that Toronto has a housing crisis and fixing it will require urgency from all levels of government, but especially the city. Right now, it's probably the number one affordability issue in the city, whether you're renting or trying to buy a home, even trying to pay your mortgage. So let's talk about housing platforms, candidates, shall we? Uh, first, another quick question for each of you. By the end of your first term, how many housing units will you have realistically started to build? So you have 30 seconds to answer this question. And Olivia Chow, we'll begin with you. And one minute? 30, seconds, 30 seconds for seconds. this one. Ah, mm -hmm. okay. It's a quick one. Uh, all right. Um, probably 10,000. Um, but mixing, this is only for building. But 1,000 that uh, would be rent supplement. Because right now, people need housing uh, immediately. And rent supplements will provide that. The 10,000s because uh, it takes about two years to build. Thank you, Olivia. And I'm just going to go down the line here. So, Mark Saunders, to you, how many will you have realistically started to build in your first term? Well, realistically, it's a matter of looking at the existing process, changing the existing process, making sure that the right resources are in place, having the right leadership, and using the necessary tools. But I guarantee you that uh, once I get in, the rate of building is going to be faster than ever before because it is a priority. It is what has caused this homeless issue. It has caused all of the issues that we have uh, right now that we're facing. And I'm looking forward to that opportunity. Thank you, Mark Saunders. Anna Bailao, for you, 30 seconds. Uh, well, I, I'm committed to building to 285,000 um, by 2031 that uh, the city has accepted. I went further. I want uh, 57,000 of that as purpose-built rental, and we'll start developing on that through planning and zoning reform so it happens quicker and we start to uptick and also uh, accelerate the process by breaking down silos inside City Hall. Okay, thank you, Anna Bailao. We'll switch shift over uh, here, Josh Matlow, for you. Your first term, how many housing units will you have realistically started to build? 30 seconds. I, I, I'd honestly be making up an exact number because there's no way that you can predict that. Uh, I would be getting going on building tens of thousands of affordable housing units with our Public Build uh, Toronto uh, initiative where we are going to be building housing on public lots, on underutilized properties that the city owns. And it'll be a combination of market, but with rent control, along with rent geared to income, affordable, deeply affordable housing, along with below market. Uh, but the reality is, is that no one can honestly tell you, you know, they can come up with a number, but they can't tell you the exact one yet. Thank you, Josh. And final uh, one for you, Mitzi, 30 seconds. How many affordable housing units will you build in yeah. your first? Well, Sure. Of all the candidates, I have the most affordable housing units committed in my plan. It's a real plan. And uh, in the first phase, which is six years, I will be building 22,000 units of affordable housing. And, um, and this is over uh, 108 projects, which includes two and three bedroom units for families with parks and parquets, playgrounds, and, uh, and retail below so that we can have uh, libraries, uh, public health offices for well baby clients. Clinics. This is about building and creating neighborhoods, and uh, and that's what Toronto needs. And this is the city being the builder, not giving it over to developers. And that's time, Mitzi. Thank you so much. Um, the city already has a program. You're all aware of this. It's called Housing Now, which offers up city-owned land to developers who will then agree to put up buildings that include affordable housing. However, not a single unit of affordable housing has been built in the four years that it's existed. And on top of that, the program is in some serious financial trouble. So our question next for you candidates is, should the city of Toronto act as a developer and build its own housing? So yes or no to that question, and you'll have one minute to explain why. We started with Olivia in the last section. Mark Saunders, we're gonna start with you uh, on this one. The, the short answer is no. Builders build, city government is responsible for creating the environment to make sure that it's built. When we look at the history and the fact that we cannot build, when we look at independent reviews that scored the city of Toronto last, I want to move it to first. And that's by leadership and it's by making sure the process within itself is proper, making sure that it takes one year for approvals, sticking a navigator in that process to make sure that the approvals are not sitting on a desk anywhere, and making sure that there's accountability. Accountability to make sure we're hitting the timelines, to ensure that the builders and to ensure that the city is, is meeting the commitments. And on top of that, 
digitizing, making sure that there are more digital processes so that we can hit the mark and make sure we hit that target of 40,000 affordable housing units within that year or within that 10 year mark that has already been stated. All right, thank you. Anna Bailau for you, yes or no. Should the city act as a developer and build more housing? We, we need all hands on backs. We need the builders, we need the nonprofits, we need three orders of government. That's how you're going to build housing, not adding more bureaucracy. What we need is to make sure that we have the the, the processes in place, the supports and the relationships with the other uh, orders of government as well. We've, we've built uh, some supportive housing in the city of Toronto, but the thousands of units that we need, and there's supply that is needed, there's affordable housing that is needed, and there's supportive housing that is needed. All these three things are different, and they are to be developed in different ways. And we need the builders at the table and the nonprofits at the table, as well as the three orders of government. Okay, thank you. Josh Matlow, your opportunity to weigh in. <clears throat> it's just, it, I, I don't believe it's fair to Torontonians to just make up numbers about how many units are going to be built. Because housing now, as you said correctly, has been a failure. After the past few years since it was, it was announced, not a single shovel has been put into the ground. This, the Public Build Toronto initiative comes from a motion that I moved at Council. And I want to implement it, and I'm going to be determined to do so as Mayor. We're going to be having a public builder rather than rest on the private sector to build deeply affordable and market and below market rate rental on city lands. We can do it because we're not going to rely on the private sector to put up the risk and the equity, which they have not done thus far. But I agree that we also need to work with the private sector to make sure that they are building housing units that have affordable options for people throughout the city. And the reality is a combination of rental supplements and other factors are going to be able to holistically address the housing crisis to the best the city can contribute. But to say that there's going to be one silver bullet or one solution isn't right. To make up numbers isn't fair. And the reality is there's a large number of things that we need to do to address housing affordability because people cannot live in the city, whether it be rent or even dream to own a home. Thank you. Josh Matlow. Yeah. Mitzi Hunter. The, the city needs real leadership when it comes to the housing file and that has to happen with the city becoming the builder. The city has to be the, both the owner and the quarterback here. We can't just leave it up to developers because you get more of the same as what you've explained with housing now. Not a single, you, no one's living in those units and in fact the signs are all up but nothing's happening. Under my plan, which I have here. I've laid it out. It's based on my experience in housing and it is based on a realistic approach where we unlock the public lands that the city already owns and starts building. And these are mid-sized. So it's 10, 15, and 20 stories and creating that infilling that we need within neighborhoods, within existing neighborhoods for families. It's an absolute real plan that has been put together. It's costed, it's timelined, and it's based on realistic assumptions. Just quickly though, I, I, I just want some clarification. Yes or no to working, at, to being a developer? Uh -huh. Yes, the city will be the builder. Absolutely. We can't just leave it up to others because we see what we've it's just more of the same and that's what I'm hearing and also what about the history you know in this in the 1960s and 70s of course we built affordable and public housing the city knows how to do that it doesn't mean that there are not partnerships but it means that the city will control and continue to own those lands Got to wrap it up there Mitzi thank you Olivia Chow last one to answer this question yes or no should the city be a developer and provide housing Yes, because we used to do that. We built 32,000 units of housing. Right now, there are 90,000 households. That's uh, enough people to fill two sky domes waiting for affordable housing. That's how desperate it is because the city has walked away from its responsibility for over a decade. And we have to come back and build. Why? It is our moral responsibility to do so. I know of people that are so desperately waiting for affordable housing and the wait list is so long that it takes 10, 12, 13 years for families to move in. And a third of them are seniors. And I know seniors like Yang that said to me, Olivia, we wait till we might 
not be able to walk anymore in order to get into affordable housing. Yes, we need to get back to housing, building right. it. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, candidates, for weighing in on that very important issue. Um, we're going to switch gears now and do a rapid-fire quiz for everyone, so we don't need to spend a lot of time quiz. on this. This oh. is quick. Um, I think you'll all pass, though. Maybe I'll go out on a limb there. This is really all about your local favourites, and so that's what we're going to ask you. Um, and it's a real, you know, it's open. I'll give you the category. You give me your favourite, okay? Josh Matlow, why don't we start with you? Your favorite Toronto patio. My favorite patio uh, would be, honestly, the Black Bull, because it is the first patio, typically. I don't know if like it always is the first, <laughs> but typically the first one that opens up when the weather gets a little nicer. Even when people are wrapped up in sweaters or blankets, they go out there and have a beer and just enjoy the potential of spring. The Black Bull, yeah. okay. Mitzi Hunter, let's go with you. Your favorite Toronto street. Oh, wow. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about my patio. Um, my favorite street, I would say Young Street. I would say, you know, I have memories as a teenager, um, just going up and down all the shops and, uh, and you know, you can just, it's walkable and it, there's a lot of energy always on Young Street. Okay, yeah. thanks Mitzi. Uh, Olivia Chow, your favorite Toronto music venue? Ooh, Phoenix on Sherborne. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I, uh, I've gone to a few concerts there, but it, I have many other ones. Can I? No, okay, just one. Just right? the one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Olivia. Okay, Mark Saunders, your favorite Toronto beach? Well, you know, I love, unfortunately, Sugar Beach. I just like the fact that it's put there and it's so pretty and it's busy all around it, but when you go there, you can just chill out and if you're facing the water, you don't feel like you're in Toronto. Oh, yes, I'm getting all the vibes from you from you all. Um, Anna Bailao, your favorite Toronto festival? Oh, Due West. It's coming up, by the way. Can I can I make a promo for Due West Fest coming up this weekend? Pitching it's usually all the first in the season. It's a great environment and uh, the smell of food and people just coming out, it's fantastic. So okay, thank you. We're gonna do everybody's one... invited to Dunn the Street. <laughs> We're going to do one more round, a couple other favorites. So, Josh, back to you. Your favorite yeah. Toronto restaurant to celebrate in? Um, I would say my favorite one? That's so hard. It's a hard it's choice. So hard. I'm sorry, I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, our favorite one... Um, can you come back to me on that? Honestly, no, you got to answer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a five second countdown um, to come you know up with actually, it. Actually, uh, uh, historically, it's been Lotus Pond uh, uh, in Agent Court. It's a vegetarian Chinese restaurant that my family have been going to for years. There we go. That might be a hidden gem. I think. It's I don't know. Okay, Mitzi Hunter, your favorite Toronto tourist attraction. My favorite Toronto tourist attraction is the AGO. Uh, so I took my niece since she was three years old and it's just beautiful architecture and it's just always changing and it's just gorgeous to visit. Great, thank you. Olivia Chow, your favorite TTC line? Ah, Spadina, Ooh. because it's <laughs> fast, it comes often and it's right, um, hmm, about 50 steps away from where I live. There you go. Convenience is everything yes. here. Um, Mark Saunders, your favorite biking or hiking trail in the city? Where do you bike, Mark? Okay. Well, no, <laughs> listen. No, no, no. The Don, <laughs> Don Valley um, East um, Ravine is where I, I've ridden with my family uh, quite a bit, and uh, I love it. It's nice and quiet. If you go early, if not, then there's a ton of traffic. The whole city goes but, in, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mark. Okay, Annabella, last one for you. Your favorite Toronto coffee spot? Paradise. Oh, yeah. Go. Okay, yeah. yeah. One word, we'll leave it at that. Good enough. In paradise, why say anything else? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Interesting suggestions from all of you. And I think there's some good ideas for Torontonians and for tourists alike on those. So thank you so much, candidates. Um, we're going to move on now to our accountability section. And for that, we asked Torontonians how important it is for their political representatives to be honest with them. I think politicians are have a reputation for not being honest and not following through. It's part, I mean, once the election happens, do we hear from any of them? I don't think so. Uh, we live in kind of this disposable society now where 
people say one thing and the next week they say the next, but I think you got you got to like kind of stick by your word. And I guess we just got to pick who the who our favorite is and hope and cross our fingers that they actually do at least have the things that they promise. Oh, I mean, without accountability, you know, what type of society would this be, right? Hey, you heard the people. They would like some accountability from those trying to be Toronto's next mayor. So who better to get some answers than the journalist? Joining me now, Sean Jeffords, our CBC Toronto's municipal affairs and city hall reporter. And Sean has been covering this election from the very beginning. Welcome. Thanks for hanging out with us. Hi, Mervyn. Hello, candidates. Uh, I'm here to ask you some questions that our audience will want some straight answers on. So you have a limited time, one minute to answer. Now, these questions are about you. So we ask that when you answer, please answer about yourself and not your rivals. I know that's a tough ask. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, to keep things interesting, um, after each of you responds to Sean's questions, one of you will get an opportunity to ask a follow-up question and then have a bit of debate back and forth. Um, and to determine who will be asking follow-up questions of which candidate, we did a random selection, promise you, and we did it with the candidates present here before the debate started. So I will name who will have the opportunity to ask the follow-up um, when sh before Sean asks his question. We're gonna be begin, Sean, I believe, with your first question to Anna Bailao and Mitzi Hunter will be asking that follow-up question. Okay. Take it away. Anna, you've been very closely tied to former Mayor John Tory. You were his deputy mayor and his housing czar. Given that background, why would voters who are looking for change or some big fixes in the city consider you in this election? Well, um, first of all, I will be hitting the ground running because I have the experience of being at City Hall for 12 years as a councillor, five as a deputy mayor. Uh, proud of the record of assisting to lead the city through a pandemic, of securing the largest uh, transit expansion deal of $30 billion, uh, and working on issues that are really important to me, like fair wage, like community benefits agreement to get opportunities for youth, like, like housing, bringing the city back into the housing business and securing bil billions of dollars. I think we come from very different backgrounds as, as a life experience that I bring to the table is very different. I'm a, an immigrant woman from a working class. We all come with our life experiences as well. And so I'll be bringing that uh, to the table and, uh, and my plan, my plan to work on, on uh, city services and building housing. But Anna, do you have to own some of John Tory's uh, record as well? Some of the warts of that, you know, the problems with homelessness, the fact that housing now has not been, you know, really gotten off the ground. Sean, I, I'm proud of my record. I came to City Hall to get things done. And I've done, I've delivered for my community. I've delivered on several areas, you know, on housing. You know, for decades, governments had been stepping away from housing. You know, there was, nobody was investing in housing. We now have a city that is back in the housing business for creating programs that are, you know, open door, that waive tax, property taxes and uh, development charges on affordable housing. We have a program to help uh, uh, nonprofits buy homes. We have, we have 3,000 units right now under construction, right now since 2017 and 15,000 units already approved as well. And there's probably a lot in your answer that Mitzi Hunter might want to have a discussion on. So Mitzi, I'll allow you your follow-up question yeah, now. I, I think it is a really good question because Toronto needs more than just trying to get housing built. We actually need to have those units for people to live in. And then over the last 10 years, homelessness has moved from 4,000. Now it's cresting over 10,000 people that have nowhere to live. And there is not one single housing now unit open and and so, you know, why should the people of the city just give you an opportunity to do more of the same, which is not getting any units built? I, I just don't think that that's what they need right now. They need change. They need real change and a real plan. And um, and it is it's it's disappointing. And I've heard people say that to me as I've been walking the the streets of Toronto. You know, why haven't we done this 
Let's more. Give, let's give Anna Bailoa a um, chance to respond. Mitzi, I, I, I've been the one that actually have been at the table to secure $2.6 billion, for example, uh, for Toronto Community Housing, which you were, you were the CEO, you understand the crisis that you left the, the corporation at. It was a chief administrative officer, Anna. So let's just, just be, correct the facts, right? I, I don't think part that of we should mislead people as well. with that. Uh, there was a $2.6 billion uh, backlog that, uh, you know, when people told me that it couldn't be done, I stopped the sale of those single family homes. They're now land trusts and we have it secured. And I'm the first one to say that there's more to be done. That's why my plan will deliver more housing, will continue to invest. So why in, should in people believe that? You want to Because uh, you I have a track record of bringing a, a, billions. You want to upload the gardener I have and the a, DVP I have a to track pay for your plan and Premier bringing, Ford has already said no. I'm, and like you, Mitzi, I'm not walking away from the negotiating table. I will always stand so up for the city. So the people have to wait even longer? No, they, you know what? That's what you're they saying. They don't have to wait because I'm ready on day one. I don't have to learn on the job. I know how City Hall works. I have the support of colleagues. I know how to get the job done. I have a track record of delivering. But you were there and you didn't do it. The, the city and I apologize, Kat. We've got to leave into the housing there business for 12 years. with programs. we got to leave it there. there. There's 3,000 units Let's give Sean an, an opportunity. Thank you, candidates, to ask <clears throat> our next candidate a question. My next question is for Mitzi, so we'll continue the discussion here. Um, <laughs> Mitzi, you have a detailed budget, which you have right there. It calls for the use of some of the city's reserves to pay for your plans. Now, those reserves are, in a very real sense, the city's rainy day funds. So why are you planning to use those reserves instead of maybe scaling back some of your promises to adjust for the difficult fiscal reality facing City Hall? Yeah, actually, under, under my plan, and you're, this is about accountability, and I committed to the people of the city to provide a plan before voting begins. Voting starts in just two days from now, on, the th on Thursday the 8th, and they have that plan. They can find it on my site. I've already delivered my first plan, my first promise on accountability. And yes, I have laid out a plan to fix the six because, you know, we can't let things just slide and just leave it up to some other government somewhere to do this for Toronto. We have to do this ourselves. And I have been th thoughtful about this and I've laid out that plan. I, in, in fact, to play pay for the six priorities, I have a very fair three and six plan. It's 6% property tax, which is similar to what the city council has right now at 5.5%. And then for those who are struggling, it's actually 50% of that. It's 3%, right? Those below $80,000. That's how we pay for my six priorities. When it comes to the hole and the mess that has been left, the over $1.1 billion each year, that is where I carefully identify which of those reserves are going to address those challenges. And it's done in a way that actually revives the city. We can't just sit still and let Toronto decline. We can't afford that. And let's make some room for follow-up question to your answer, Mitzi Hunter. And Josh Matlow has the opportunity to ask a follow-up. Mitzi. I appreciate, like, like my plan, uh, I've been upfront about exactly what I'm going to do with regard to raising revenue, looking at ways to address waste, making better decisions to better prioritize our city's finances, and recognizing that we all need to do more, frankly, to address the $1.5 billion shortfall that's being artificially covered up by rating the reserves and the $46 billion pressure that our city is facing. In other words, no matter what our plans are, we're all going to have to make sure that we address that fiscal Just reality. I'm going to ask a follow-up. I'm going to play speaker so, here. So the, so the follow-up is, um, I've heard plans from you, and whether I disagree or agree with you, I appreciate that you've put that forward. But I heard Mark Saunders say that he's only essentially just going to cut. But he hasn't said what he's going to cut, and he hasn't said what services Torontonians this rely on. This is a follow-up from Mitzi Hunter, Have please, you Josh. heard anything that Mark Saunders has said that <laughs> makes sense with regard to balancing the budget? Interesting. <laughs> To, to answer your question, no, I, I have not. I, I believe it's very risky when candidates say that they're going to keep property taxes below inflation because what that's a signal for is that it's going to cut, cut critical services that makes this a livable, safe city. And I think that's very dangerous. I, I challenge you too, um, Josh Matlow, because you've said that, you know, you're going to take $128 million out of the police services budget. So how are you going to handle that? you know, when we do need to have safety in our city and would that not put our city more at risk? That was actually a very thoughtful question. Um, the, 
The top line item in the operating budget is the police. It's $1.16 billion. And so rather than get into, um, you know, looking at any sort of deep cuts in any of the budgets that we have, given our fiscal reality, as I just mentioned to all of you, you know that, I'm going to be freezing the inflationary raise. So in other words, that money has to go toward proactive efforts to uh, support youth at risk, to uh, create youth hubs, to offer uh, people support for trauma, counseling, mental health. And I, I know you share these values as well. The reality is, because we have such a dearth of funds in the budget, we can't just sort of pretend that all but the money's going to land. But the raises are contracted and they're negotiated. So are you going to break the contracts? No, no. And, you know, we'll try to, we'll try to make time for, for more of this discussion between the two of you. We've just got to move on. So I appreciate the back and forth. More we do, yes, more follow-ups on the follow-ups. Sean's got another question for another one of our candidates. Questions for you, Olivia. Olivia, are, are you not playing right into the hands of your rivals here on this stage by not committing to a specific number when it comes to a property tax increase? Why haven't you been more forthcoming about your plans for property taxes? Mm -hmm. Good question. Since the election of Rob Ford, we're doing budgeting backwards. He picked an arbitrary number <clears throat> and then shuff all the services inside it. And what's the impact? We're seeing the impact on the street. People are waiting for TTC buses. We have uh, TTC decline. Very few affordable housing being built. What we need to do is being people-centered. It's budget start with people. Let's look at all the services that are needed, build the budget, calculate how much it cost, and then look at alternate way of financing, which I gave some examples, right? Luxury homes and uh, Olivia, speculators. Can you give, a, can you give yeah, us a number? But, that, but, but hang on. Then you go and ask the federal and provincial government uh, for support and for partnership, wow. right? And then look at the inflation rate and then look at the property tax. This is the way that have been budgeted for decades. That's the process. I know because I've been on budget committee for 10 years, just picking up a budget. I gotta say, Olivia, from, I've been at the province. Air. I've been the associate finance minister. It doesn't work that way. Oh, the, the, the province is not going to come I appreciate and you give wanting you to a weigh pot in, of Mitzi. money. It does not work Wait, that Missy, way. Okay, Mitzi, you work. know what? Actually, no. this will open us up to the candidate who did draw Olivia's name for a follow-up. Should I respond to that? It's well. Let's let's allow Mark Sa Mark Saunders his opportunity to ask a follow-up of you, and we'll see if there is time for the exchange. Thank you. Well, Olivia, when we talk about affordability, and one of the things that uh, resonates a lot is the fact that you really do not have a whole lot of uh, like for public safety when I look at your relationship with the police service. Uh, time after time, you've said, quote, you've been ashamed. Uh, when we talk about First Responders Day, that this came up the other day, you said thank you to everybody except the police. So, so my question is, when public safety is a priority in the city right now, because that is the one issue that everybody has an issue with, how are you going to be able to work with a police service that you do not like? And you have said that over and over again, and you have cut taxes at every single opportunity when it came to public safety questions. Mm -hmm. Mark, leadership means good listening. I said very clearly that I'm grateful for the service of the police that morning, two days ago. All of you will have heard it. If you listen very intently, let me quote on CBC radio in a tearful interview days after her son's murder, Andrea Magalese told CBC that more needs to be done to help people in crisis. She's the one that lost her kid, a 16-year-old in um, Q subway station. Here's her quote. We need more social services. We need more investment into physical and mental health. We need more support for my housing. Was about Let the me finish, service, please. I the feel. Service. Listen, listen, listen to people. Because they're saying that policing is not the only solution. We need more support for housing. 
I feel like if things keep going the way they are going right now, so many people are going to be suffering the horrible pain that I'm going through question, right now. You know, it with is all, the with question. All, with all due respect, if you think I'm about, about safety, your relationship Mark, you as mayor, me, just as mayor, on. your relationship with the Toronto Police Service, even when you're on the board, Mark, listen, you're extremely Mark, negative. Mark, you tried to bro- just hang on a second. You, you Being broke a leader the law means trying to break listening. a line, listening and you were supposed and to be a leader when it comes to Allow me policing. to finish. Okay, You've got 10 more seconds. Just answer the question, Olivia Chow. Just 10 more seconds. Just answer the question. That's my point. You know, the safety also, you cannot, there are things that you don't see very you much. You cut the police intimate budget violence, every opportunity you intimate possibly could. Intimate partner violence opportunity. is huge. They're taking and 20 minutes to answer 911 calls. Okay, I apologize. And who after you became I, the chief? Thank Excuse you. me, speaking about 911 calls, Thank it you, went. candidates. It's just going to get a little tougher to follow along in the conversation if there's crosstalk. So uh, we're going to move on to Sean's next uh, question for our next candidate, and, and we can perhaps continue the conversation. So, Mark, this question is for you. You said you need to open the books at City Hall before committing to a specific budget policy. So the city's budget process every year is weeks long. It's open to the public. The city's budget information is available in great detail online year-round. In light of that, why do you continue to say that you can't put together a costed budget when other candidates on the stage have? So when we talk about experienced leadership, I had to run a budget of a billion dollars every year for five years, leading 7,400 people. When it deals with a budget, you have to look at what you have First, before you can start asking. I have had people try to decipher the budget that you say is in extreme detail, and it is not in extreme detail. People cannot navigate through the existing system looking at the public documents to put things together. We have to first be able to justify how we're spending our money before we can start asking. The taxpayers deserve that. So when discussions are happening about heated bike lanes, when discussions are happening about a $50, $50 million facelift, then changed into a $400 million project, when people right now are dealing with affordability, the taxpayers' dollars should be respected, and every penny should be used towards But Mark, isn't it first. incumbent upon you to do that work right now? Absolutely, it's important to do that work, to look at the budget and to break it down and to find out exactly how money should be spent. Yes. And then, of course, the leadership of executing. It is not acceptable for us to be okay to walk around people downtown. It is not acceptable for us to look at the state, to look at the state that uh, young Dundas Square is right now. Money should be put in towards things by way of priority, by way of cities' needs, by way of businesses right now that are suffering. Have you done and that is being... Have you looked at the budget? And have you put one together? Yes, I, where, I have, where is it? I have looked at the budget. <laughs> where is and it? I am seeing where people should be where they're not. When I talk about having external resources out helping people instead of people that are behind where desks. Where? Mark, and where, making where does sure the money actually come from sure. to do what you're saying you want to do? Yeah. You said you're going to cut. Where's, I've made it very clear. I look at the budget first, and then I prioritize where the money is going. But have you done that, and where is it? And I've, I've got to just, I, I'm sorry, i got to step in here, because there was a candidate who did get yeah. the uh, official opportunity to ask a follow-up in our random draw, and that is Olivia Chow. Yeah. Mark, the city is, has 50% of them are renters, and they're scared right now of rent evictions, stem evictions, uh, rent going up. What is your plan, and how much are you going to be spending on renters? And a secondary, because it's about money, when you were achieved during those years, your budget went up 12%, okay? And during that time, the wait for 911 calls, because you mentioned it to me a few minutes ago, went up, okay? So just two questions. One is, how much will you be spending for renters to help protect them, to help them so they won't get evicted. And secondly, why is it? How much did you end up spending on 911? Give me that budget figure. Under you, with the $1 billion budget, how much did you put in on 911? And why did it went up? Let's, the wait allow, times? let's allow time for okay. Mark Saunders to respond. Great. Your floor. So what everyone seems to forget is that the police service is one agency of City Hall. So when we have candidates like Anna Bailao and Josh Matlow giving you a 0% increase when the calls and the demands for safety are going up 
and then expectations, it causes me to allocate the funds as best as possible, utilizing tax dollars as best as possible to have the most successful outcomes. But if you have people that are voting to defund the police, if you're having people that are saying take away, take, take, away, that take away their guns, and if that is the environment of government that makes the decisions on how to fund policing, you're going to get bad outcomes, number one. Number two, the issue when it comes to rent or having a place to stay has been caused by City Hall because supply is so low. Agencies and developers don't even want to come into the city. The city scores last with all of the municipalities across the country because it is defective. Leadership requires changing the process to make sure that it is working, that it is healthy, Mark, so that people can come and build. How much does it take to do 911? Let's be sensitive to our listeners on CBC Radio. It's hard to tell who is talking. Can I just respond? So there are a number of name checks here. How much did you put into Yes, I, we are also running out of time, so we want to give everyone okay, equal sorry. opportunity to have their voice heard. So, Mark Saunders, 10 more seconds, okay. that's all I can Great. give you. When I kept requesting for more funds for communications, I was not getting it. But I was the one who put the most resources and the most money in to try to get it up to speed out of any other Mark, chief you can't of police. Okay. Both ways. You yeah. said so you were not a very effective managing a billion dollar budget, that. but now you're saying I mean, it's it, badly managed. Like, you can't, you can't have it, it both ways. It was not funded by City Hall. These people here are responsible for not giving increase. the proper money. When you look at the police, I, the you, population, trying to it is on one of the that. lowest. Mark, thank you, candidates. One of the lowest in the country. They're, they're one of the lowest. A, okay, yeah. thank you. I just want to make sure that, thank you, candidates. that I clear that I never voted to defund the police. Five seconds. Okay, thank you, Anna Bailao, with that clarification. Um, one more question for one more, one more candidate, Sean. Josh. Sean. <laughs> <laughs> your critics have questioned your record on housing, Josh. Yes. They noted your voting record at council, and they've asked you in a number of debates so far why you pushed back and you voted against density, specifically sometimes in your ward. Could you explain that record and say why a voter worried about building housing would vote for you on June 26th? Easily. So there has been more growth in the ward that I represent than... Uh, most any, most any other ward uh, in the city, aside from part of the downtown. So growth has not been an obstacle. Uh, what I will never apologize for is pushing back on just building buildings without ensuring that we have services, such as school capacity. And if you go to areas like Young and Eglinton, you'll see signs saying that your kids won't go to the local school uh, if you move into the building. Uh, we also need better infrastructure. We need parks. We need uh, community spaces. And that's something that I've always advocated for, and I've been successful in getting new community centers built, more child care, et cetera. So for me, it's never been a matter of, like, should it be, uh, you know, supporting development or anti-development? It's more about, does it leave us better than we found it? And the plan that I have in my campaign, in my platform, is to ensure that we don't just have these sort of fights between, you know, the yimby nimby factions over each and every building, but we actually empower our planners the way that this is what they went to school for. But Josh, to is plan this delaying things, though? No, is this no, delaying buildings? No, no, no. I mean, no, it, uh, that's, not, that's not a fact. That's not a fact. And frankly, the province, <laughs> the, uh, oh the, province, the province actually very clearly prescribes the timeline. Uh, I would actually say to an arbitrary level. But it, it, what we need is forward planning so that we don't just plan building by building or have our planners react. But we actually look at the whole area, the whole neighborhood, and make sure that we have services and infrastructure plan. to support housing. And ultimately, it can't just be a supply of condos. It's got to be affordable housing. It's got to be what I've proposed, Public Bill Toronto, the third sector. But we also need more social housing I can tell you, Josh, and more supportive your, housing. Your That's delay it, it has it. delayed the Scarborough but subway. You what, fought, are, what are you talking you about? You fought against that? Do I get so my, clearly, uh, May I just have so that 30 clearly, seconds that, so that, to respond Restore, to that? So that's, I, that's, I, like, that's what I remember. That's what I remember. You fought the people of Scarborough from their investment. Sorry, Mitzi. It's Anna Bailo, who's the candidate who has yeah. an opportunity okay. to ask just the follow-up. Like, but that was and just, by the way, just Josh, factually untrue that well, 
The only Carolina, thing oh, factual Mitzi, 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 the only, the only the only thing on that delayed here, that delayed fought, transit, the only thing, the Mitzi, 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 I'm years. sorry, I'm okay, sorry, excuse years. me. That is just that is dishonest and wrong. Five more seconds. The record, really the record will show that the, the reason that Mitzi, Mitzi, you first of all, you used to support the RT before you ran for office. Sure, I can support more than one mode of transit. That is time. I'm sorry, that is time. More than one mode of transit, and I do. I am a subway champion. Mitzi, I am an LRT champion. Mitzi, I'm. I've got to. I've got to. I've got to restore some order here. We need to. Uh, we need to allow Anna Bilo. It is. You had, it is correct. But you know what is also you know correct? You were there. Uh, it is, and you, you try to stop that Scarborough subway every step out of the way. Thank you, But Anna. you've also reduced the density. You talk about the plans, but when we had the plan for Young and Eglinton, you also reduced the density on that. And you you just said that you have more development than anybody else. I, again, you have more development than I did. Meanwhile, I was able to get yes. three times the affordable housing units out of my development than you were, and, and you can't even work with counselors. How are you going to be able to get an agenda? You said you're not going to go work, you know, use your strong mayor powers. You cannot work with counselors. I, I have six counselors. What's, you have came, a, I need I, you to ask a question. Yes, Anna. how is he going to get an agenda, a plan through council? Because you can't work with counselors. You can't work with builders, with the private sector. You can't work with the nonprofit sector. We had 140 Merton, which thank, is, thank you. Thank which you, is a, 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 the, a nonprofit um, the, the reality housing is, that we the had reality to fight is, for density. I, listen, it, it's, I think it's important to debate during an election. But we should be doing it honestly and based on the facts. So the fact remains are, that the only reason, just to begin, the only reason that there were delays to adding necessary transit to Scarborough, higher, higher order transit to Scarborough, is because there was a full, fully paid LRT plan that David Miller championed, that was reversed by Rob Ford, that then was changed by John Tory, and then reversed back by Doug Ford to three stops, those were the only delays that actually happened. That is a fact. And, and you said Excuse me. Scarborough doesn't have the density no, no, and doesn't deserve I, I just, a subway. Just, I know you said that. But Mitzi, because Mi I Mitzi, Mitzi, fought for more Mitzi, for Mitzi, Scarborough. Mitzi, 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 and you did not. Throughout your career, That's you fought honest. the Scarborough Mitzi, subway that's Mitzi, and you fought Mitzi, the density. Mitzi, Mitzi, the okay, Mitzi, you can tell got, them you've changed your mind, whatever, because you're running to be mayor, but you can't revise history. Okay, I've got 10 seconds left maximum. Josh Matlow, 10 more seconds, that's it. Uh, it, it, it is important to debate, but honestly, this hyperbole, this stuff being thrown out isn't helpful and it's not fair to Torontonians. All right, thank you, candidates, for that. Sean, you led a very spirited segment Who here. Who knew? Who <laughs> knew? Appreciate it. And with that, <laughs> that you, brings candidates. an end, uh, yes, to our accountability segment. Sean Jeffords, thank you very much for that. And Thanks, Maribel. Thank you all, candidates. Very interesting. Election day is June 26th, with early voting from June 8th to 13th. CBC Toronto is here to help you make your decision at the ballot box. Head to cbc.ca slash Toronto. We've laid out all the platforms of the candidates here in studio, and you can compare them all for yourself. You can look up their policies on housing, renting, transit, public safety, and general livability. We've also got pitches from the other candidates in the race about why they deserve your vote. Remember, our a record 102 candidates want to be mayor of the city. On June 26th, only one will win. Five of them are here with us in studio at the Canadian Broadcasting Centre. And for the all five, I've got another yes or no question for you now. This one is about climate change. Toronto has a plan to reduce community-wide greenhouse gas emissions in the city, and that is to net zero by 2040. You're all aware of this. It's called Transform TO. The question is, will you commit to fully funding Transform TO to deal with climate change? Yes or no, and you will each have one minute to explain why. Let's start over here. Josh Matlow, you can kick things off, please. I believe that I'm the only uh, candidate running who has uh, a, a genuinely dedicated uh, funding plan for Transform TO. It's a very ambitious plan. I want Toronto not just to be a participant in fighting the climate crisis, I want us to be a global leader. So uh, while we need to move forward with Transform TO, it's not good enough just to announce that we've got it. So my plan is to de dedicate a corporate commercial uh, parking levy. It won't uh, affect uh, like small grocers or small plazas or, or you know, small, small shops. But for the Walmarts of the world, they can pitch in. So 
staff at the city estimate that we'll be able to bring in just under between just under 200 million between two. Uh, over $500 million a year. I'm going to be taking uh, $200 million, putting it toward Transform TO, and that will also include reversing those just wrong-headed cuts to the TTC, because TTC, if you, if you make it more safe, reliable, and affordable, more people will choose the better way, and that obviously contributes to a better environment and a quality of life. All right, thank you, Josh. Let's move on to Mitzi Hunter okay. now. Will you commit to fully funding Transform TO? Yes or no? One minute to explain why. I do support Transform TO and I will commit to that. Um, in, under my plan, we have integrated uh, climate res resiliency and response. So I've started off with the re resiliency because we have to recognize that climate change is real. We have a, a crisis right now. When you look at the extreme weather, there are fires burning all over the, this country. That affects our city as well. And I want to make sure we protect seniors from extreme heat, extreme cold, make sure flooding, which is a real risk to property owners. I want to make sure that that's protected. In addition to that, uh, my housing plan also includes making sure that we have like tower renewal. I've increased the funding for that so that we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in terms of how we live in the city. I want to add more trees so that we have a cooler city in terms of the, the heat. We add more trees and park 17 acres of park. I want to add as part of my housing plan. I want to add solar panels. So I'm integrating our response into the existing plans that I have to build more affordable housing and of course investing more in transit. I'm the only candidate that has outlined how I will invest in more subways. The North York Scarborough subway extension needs to be built as well. Thank you, Mitzi. Olivia Chow, to you. Will you commit to fully funding Transform TO? Mm -hmm. Yes, I will. Uh, you can hear the voice is a bit hoarse. I was wearing a mask coming down because the air is not very good, caused by the fires, which is caused by the climate crisis. We know that it is happening. So we have to keep it under 1.5 degree. And we can invest in public transit. That's really important because it will reduce the greenhouse gas emission. <clears throat> Number two, we burn less and pay less by retrofitting homes, whether it's TCHC homes or our homes, solar panels, all that, as partner with the federal government again to do the eco-energy retrofit. And the new homes that we're building, <clears throat> we talked about building a lot of new housing, right? Just a few minutes ago. Let's make sure they use the highest green standard. <clears throat> Excuse me. So lastly, the waste footprint, the waste reduction, we have to do it because a lot of greenhouse gas emission comes from that. And a lot of uh, condominiums and high rises are now not sorting so we, um, for their compost and recycling. Let's put the tri uh, sorter in uh, so that there'll be more reduction of waste. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. I'll let you have a sip of water yeah. and we'll move Bad on air. to... <laughs> yeah. Um, Mark Saunders now, yes. your commitment. Will you so, commit to fully funding Transform What I can say, my plan is not to allow us to sit comfortably and allow people to be congested in traffic of the equivalency of 23 working days a year. The fact that we're scoring seventh in the world for our congestion and the amount of carbon footprint that that is causing. I'm a strong believer that we have to expand on our subway grid for a multitude of reasons. When I knock on the doors and, and talk to people, their complaint is getting around the city and getting around the city effectively. And if we don't do anything about that, if we don't work towards working collectively to making our transit system more robust, we're number one in Canada, but we are not doing great. We have to make sure that the funding's there so that when the newcomers come into the city, they have opportunities of going to and from work within a limited time frame and people that are on roads or off roadways and using more transit system. And you've explained your plan, but clarify for me, was that a yes or a no to funding fully transform to you? My plan is about reducing the, the carbon footprint that's there. And it's by working hard, working with agencies, it's working with the public to see what we need to, get, to do to get do you, there. Do you acknowledge Fair there's to... a climate crisis? There's absolutely a climate crisis. Just fair so to say no on that. I'm just marking it down on my just for. I, I, I'm saying so that we're going to move to. No, I'm going to be funding a lot for the green footprint that we, that we need to do. But what about the existing city plan to it's, it's a, it, get it to actually is going to work it, with that existing plan, plan. But you know, there are some flaws with the plan. So to commit to things that are flawed, so I'm no. not supportive of. So, so it needs to be fixed and it needs to be done better. 
to know. Thank you, Mark Saunders. Uh, last response from you, Anna Bayer. That is actually a very good plan that the City of Toronto has. Uh, ambitious with uh, targets for all three orders of government. Yep. Everything that we will be doing under my leadership will have a climate lens. From how we plan the city to how we build the city, both by guidelines on how we provide to who's building to, leading by example. We're just developing the Etobicoke Civic Center. That's going to be a net zero building to make sure that we're also leading by example as well. The way that we pl uh, uh, plan our mo mobility to make sure that investing in the DTC, I will invest in the DTC, I will invest in making sure that we have, you know, extended working, uh, working hours so that when construction happens on the roads, that it happens quicker so we can move more quickly. Absolutely. We need, we need a full mobility strategy. That's what I have because I am not a us versus them. I'm about moving people. If they are on TTC, if they are on cars, if they are on cycling, if they are pedestrians and move them in a safe way. But everything, even the way that we purchase, how we purchase our buses, we have the exception of Edmonton. I think they have one more bus than we do. We have the largest electric fleet. I, under my leadership, we will keep going that way. Everything will have a climate lens. All right. Thank you, Anna Bailao. Thank you, candidates, for sharing your thoughts on climate change. Um, lots of really heavy discussions that we've had. So for now, maybe let's do another rapid fire quiz. Um, and for this, I'm going to ask you to choose between this or that. So you'll have two options to choose from. And this is quick. So, you know, you don't have to explain too, too much. Uh, maybe just a couple of lines or two. Olivia Chow, let's start with you. So, what's your choice? East End or West End? Oh, good Lord. Oh, that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> that's too hard. West End, uh, there's Humber River and then there's a Scott Bob. Oh my yep. God. Um, West End. Thank you. Okay. Mark Saunders, AGO or ROM? ROM. Fast, okay. Uh, Anna Bilo, Drake or The Weeknd? Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> the Weeknd. The Weeknd, okay. Josh Matlow, for you, Taste of the Danforth or Salsa on St. Clair? Salsa on St. Clair, absolutely. Right. right, okay. Mitzi Hunter, Ontario Place or The Science Center? The Science Center, <laughs> obviously. Okay, back to you. We'll do one more round. Olivia Chow, The Gardener or the lakeshore? Lakeshore. Mark Saunders, ravines or beaches? Ravines. Right, you do the bike ride in yes. the ravines. Okay, <laughs> uh, Anna Bailo, tiff or hot dogs? Uh, hot dogs. <laughs> Hot dogs. Hot dogs, I know. They're, Tough they're also great. They, they are, are, right? Oh, yeah, it's, a, it's a win win yeah, no yeah, matter yeah. what. Um, Josh, Scarborough Bluffs or Humber Bay Park? Scarborough Bluffs. Okay. Final one, and maybe I told a little fib there. It's not two, it's three. Mitzi Hunter, last one for you. Favorite Toronto sports teams? Leafs, oh. Raptors, Jays. Oh, I can't choose. I love all three. I actually love all of our Toronto sports teams. I love them all. I love TFC. Them all. Now we've got four to choose from. Yeah, I know. Those were tough, but thank you so much for playing along. Uh, it's just really fun to kind of get to know. But I also like choices. Humber Bay as well. Yeah. And I'm on the garden. <laughs> <laughs> yes to everything. Um, okay. Well, let's talk about something else that everyone in Toronto can see now candidates and that's the physical state of our city from potholes to the destroyed garbage bins yeah. to I mean was this the big headline grabber that it can take up to two weeks to clean up a dead raccoon from Toronto yeah, streets okay first of all just yes or no just yes or no but you'll have an opportunity to elaborate in our follow-up questions yes or no do you agree with this statement Toronto is in disrepair. Mark Saunders. No, no, I don't think it's in disrepair. Um, That's fine, we'll go and we'll carry on with it. Thank you. Anna, Toronto's in disrepair, yes or no? No. Josh. Yes. Mitzi. Yes, we're gonna fix the six. Olivia. Not completely. Okay. That wasn't a yes or a no, I'll, oh. I'll just point out. You told us we could explain. <laughs> <laughs> we were waiting for that. There's, yeah. that. There's context. Exactly. There's context. Yeah. context. Yeah. And, and now's exactly. your opportunity. Um, so, here's the question. On day one, what is the top thing you will fix and how 
will you pay for it? This is a one minute answer. Mitzi Hunter, let's start with you. Absolutely. So I do have a six point plan to, <laughs> to fix the six, uh, because I think if you take any objective measure, whether it's the congestion on our streets or the fact that we're not filling those potholes and people are busting up their rims um, or the snow is not being cleared. We had so many calls uh, to my office as the MPP for Scarborough Guildwood on that just this year alone. And so we have to make sure that we have a vibrant, livable city, and I will make sure that on day one, I am investing in those those priorities with a three and six plan. I'm the only candidate that has transparently put that forward, and it's a fair, innovative, and progressive way to provide the revenues that the city needs to do those things. Top thing you'll fix, though, on day one. You know, on day one, it has to be the affordability for me. That's the livability of our city is dependent on people being able to live here. We have young people who are leaving our city. That's putting our economy and jobs at risk risk in Toronto right now with that brain drain. So I will fix the housing issue on day one. I will proclaim that there's no surplus uh, city properties. All of it is going to be for affordable housing. All right. Thank you, Mitzi Hunter. Let's go over to Olivia Chow now. Olivia, on day one, what's the top thing you will fix? How will Only you pay one? for it? We're asking uh, for your top priority. Okay. Potholes, because it's July by that time. And Oh my God, the potholes are really bad. I, I can't slip into the opening libraries on Sundays. So okay, uh, and and I think a lot of it is um, just encouraging some of the city staff to do better, but helping them uh, providing a bit more funds because in the last decade, there's a lot of been cutbacks and. Um, that includes the, the libraries, in, includes the potholes that are not being filled, right? And so, in providing them with the funds, where will, would those funds be coming from? Well, I already talked about the importance of um, funding through, uh, I'm not going to do the gardener because it's three years down the road, it's safe quite a million, lots of millions of dollars. Awesome. And and then what you could do is actually open it up to waterfront and it allows um, 8,000 units of housing. But back to the potholes, it is really destroying cars. The, the alignment plus cyclists, it's really quite dangerous. So thank you, we Olivia. have to fix the potholes first. Okay, thank and you. And I don't think it will cost that much money to fix the potholes. Mark Saunders, what would you fix on day one? Day and your one, plan to listen, fix when, I, when I knock on the doors, it is the public safety piece, specifically the subway. Uh, the ridership is down 70 to 70% 70 right now. Uh, parents are concerned about their kids using the subway, whether it's going to school or going downtown. Uh, family members are concerned about their other family members getting to and from. So making sure that we start that plan in effect right away, uh, mm -hmm. making sure that I'm working with the province to see the funding that's necessary, because if we can't get our subways running again and people feeling safe to get on the subways, small businesses will be affect, tourism will be affect, the quality of life just for the vibrancy of our city will have a direct effect on, on the state that it's in right now. Thank you, Mark Saunders. Anna Bailao, for you. Day well, one. As one. mayor, I'll, I will be focusing on making life easier and more affordable, and that comes with, you know, uh, fixing a lot of the services that you were talking about, but that will happen with tackling our budget. And to tackle that $1.5 billion can be done by just increasing property taxes. Olivia doesn't tell us by how much she's increasing, but staff told us that if you were going to use property taxes to fill that hole, it would be a 39% property tax increase that you would need. You know, we have a $46 billion operating and capital pressure as well. As mayor, that's my priority number one, to make sure that we get a fair deal for the city of Toronto so that we can have predictable and sustainable funding, we can fix services and we can build housing and we can make life more affordable, not less affordable. I can give you a few seconds, Olivia, to respond to Anna Bailao in, in your property tax and, and the fact that there is no number that you've pinned mm -hmm. to this, mm -hmm. but Anna's 39% suggestion as well is, is mm -hmm. that's how much property taxes will have to come <laughs> No. By. Uh, absolutely not. That's I talked about the modest the increase, but uh, yes, building affordable housing would be the top priority, but I thought you were just asking the questions about the choices that you're giving us in terms of um, the state of good repair yep. of any it's number of It's just an opportunity to yeah. respond. Um, I already did earlier on. I don't think we need to go down that road again, but I do agree, though, 
then we need to work together, all of us, <clears throat> to have a better deal from the federal and provincial government because we cannot continue the way it is. We have to have a source of revenue that grows with the economy. Thank we you. We all yeah. agree on that. Got to move on. Josh Matlow, what yeah. would be your number one thing to fix on day one? There are so many different complex challenges that we're facing. We just had um, uh, a group of refugees come in uh, from Ethiopia and Kenya, and they had nowhere to go. Uh, they're, a, they're a group of people trying to find motels, places for them right now. Uh, yes, the roads are in disrepair. Yes, the TTC has been cut. Uh, yes, it's hard to get our kids in direct programs. We need to open up libraries on Sundays. We should open up schools during after hours. There are so many different challenges that we face. So the number one thing that we need to do is fix the budget both the governance framework and the financial framework, and I agree, and I hope we would all agree, that the only way to actually address all the different challenges that we face is to both look at both revenue that we need to bring in, and I've already announced that I'm gonna do that. We've gotta be honest about that. We've gotta get real about that. We also need to cut waste wherever it exists and make better decisions at City Hall. And then ultimately, we need a better arrangement with the higher levels of government. And the negotiations with them are gonna have to be contextual to the kind of person and the kind of people we're working with. I think it's different with the feds as it is with Doug Ford because he bullies people and he rolls you over if you don't go in with a position of strength. I would also submit that we need to work with fellow municipalities big cities across Canada and in Ontario, because Toronto is not often the one that other levels of government want to dedicate funding and supports to unilaterally, but if we work with our colleagues, we can, we can have a stronger position. Thank you. So, of everyone out on this, this platform here today, I'm the only one that has put out a clear call to the federal and provincial government for a better and fairer deal for cities, in Toronto included, but all cities. A 1% you know from, from the HST. I that's not true. A 1% from the HST would provide $800 million dollars in funding that Toronto Marivelle. desperately needs. And that is something that I will need to make. I've already started Marivelle. to do that. Thanks, Even Betsy. before... Um, from day June 26th. One, thank from you, day Anna. one, I've been talking about a fair deal. I've put a proposal on the table that some might agree or disagree, but I have from day one said the province needs to take responsibility for the garden and the DDP. Yeah, but that's a non-starter. The Premier has already a, said it, no It's a non-starter, maybe it's a, for He's already you. said no to you that. You know what? People also so took, you said no to the $2.6 billion. Anna, Anna, but the Anna, Premier in fairness, made you the made base, you has based all of your promises, though, on a hope that Doug Ford will do something that he said he wouldn't do. There's very much cost, and there is, as we all agree, a the one percent fair deal the, is much okay, bigger than that. I got it. The only and person sorry, candidates the experience of city one. We are yeah, shorting, city getting city short on time. Brings Thank council you, candidates. That brings the experience. We're going to move on now to our, is, our, our is, final is segment. We've got to move on, and lots more to get through. So, so let's do that. Um, I mean, be picking up on this tone here because now we're going to move on to something that frustrates almost everyone in this city, and that is just trying to get around Toronto right now. Um, candidates, these questions are all directly based off of your platforms, and we're gonna go one by one through them. Um, Mark Saunders, let's, let's begin with you. Uh, you've laid a lot of blame of, uh, on congestion on bike lanes um, as the reason why we've got so much congestion in the city, like the bike lanes on University Avenue. Wouldn't making cycling less accessible, potentially less safe, actually lead to more people getting in cars and creating even more congestion and traffic woes? I'll give you one minute to respond, sure. please. Yeah, so again, uh, when I speak on the bike lanes, I've been very clear. I've not said that I'm anti-bike lane, but I do not agree with how it's being done because it is having negative effects, A, on businesses, and B, on congestion. When you pick the two busiest streets in the country and make them single lane and then wind up with congestion, it is academic. It is a wrong choice. There's certain communities and there's certain ways in which it can be done. If you look at Eglinton Avenue West, for example, the bike lanes are fantastic there. On Ellesmere, certain portions, I've seen the bike lanes there. We can do it right by working collectively and making sure that we do it by communicating with the areas that it's going to have the most impact. The primary arteries are not the best choices. We can do it, but we can do it right. And right now, the way it has been done is not working. When I'm talking to BIAs and their concerns of not wanting the extension, they are going, we are going to lose businesses with this. I think that that's something that should be heard and should be dealt with as a leader by listening and then making the application for those bike lanes. We can have a successful conclusion. 
Thank you for that, Mark Saunders. Olivia Chow, to you. Your platform um, seems to be focused on improving transit, as you've talked about, um, and bike infrastructure mm -hmm. in this city. So in one minute, what would your message to drivers be? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I talked about fixing potholes, but uh, we are really tired being stuck behind uh, in cars in traffic. Uh, but the only way to solve it is by having less cars on the road, really, because it's congestion. You need to have good alternative on public transit. Right now, after the budget cuts, the fare goes up, and then it, it costs about $200 per family more, a family of four, right now, to take TTC. So you have less people taking TDC, and then you have more people in cars. The other thing is that because of surface cut, what you're seeing is <clears throat> people waiting longer for buses or on the subway. As a result, again, fewer of them uh, take, take the TDC. And, and TDC, because it's not kept up with the state of good repair, you saw just yesterday, the, between Kennedy and Warden, there was a breakdown, right? So we have to massively invest in TTC in order to get the roads less congested. All right, thank you, Olivia. Uh, Josh Matlow, um, <coughs> your approach is somewhat similar to what Olivia has been talking about too. Um, so I'll ask kind of the same question. What would your message to those who drive in Toronto be in terms of how you would solve the congestion issue? When uh... When I'm driving in the middle of traffic and I'm frustrated that I can't get anywhere because a whole bunch of people are on either side of me and we're not moving, I, I recognize that I am part of that traffic. And, uh, and I agree that if we have less congestion on our roads, then we're able to get to where we want to get to. Um, but we need to provide options for people that are realistic. So, for example, we need bike lanes that are safe. Uh, people are not gonna choose to bike um, if they are not feeling safe and they don't have a direct route to where they need to get to safely. Yes, we have to do it thoughtfully, but we have to expand the network. We also need to improve TTC, and this is why I dedicated funds toward reversing the cuts, so that we can finally have more reliable, safe, and people need to feel safe in the TTC, and I have a proposal for that along with it being more affordable so people choose the better way again. We need places for people to walk. We need options for people. And if we have a truly multi, multimodal city that addresses safety and reliability and the ability to get around to where you need to go, whether it be school or, or work or wherever you need to get to, then we actually relieve that congestion, that pressure on all of us. All right. Thank you, Josh Matlow. Mitzi Hunter, to you. Um, you want to boost the number of crossing guards. Uh, increase the snow clearing budget uh, and create a team focused all around this issue. A minute to explain where you will get the money to fund that plan. Yeah, sure. I, well, it's my plan to fix the six. It's a three and six plan. It will provide a very fair way for managing property taxes. And I, I actually believe that we need to present the city with a plan. And that's what I have done. So when they elect me, they know exactly what they are going to get. It's 6%. And those who have an income of 80000 or below, it'll be half that at 3%, well below the rate of inflation. For seniors who have an income of 80000 or below, it's actually no increase at all on their property taxes. And for small businesses, uh, no increase. For creative activities, because we are a creative city, we need that creative arts uh, sector, there's also for small businesses in that no increase as well. That is what I'm putting forward. And, you know, it's a, it's a plan that is laid out. So yes, there will be sense. a congestion officer that will help to coordinate those activities across departments as well, allocated. making sure that all the construction that's happening on, a, on, on this blocking our streets, that we have prioritization and coordination for that. Thank you, Mitzi Hunter. Anna Bailo, to you. Your approach focuses on ticketing drivers who park illegally during rush hour or if they block intersections. Uh, these are steps that John Tory talked about and steps that he in fact started. I moved the motion actually. 
Just and that Josh Matlow has moved it's the true. motion on. Check it. <laughs> Team effort at City Hall. It's there. true, it's true. Um, a minute to answer this for you. They're small steps. How do you think those will make a big difference? Well, you need uh, a full plan. Investment in the TTC attracting ridership back. Safe, reliable, convenient way to bring people back to the TTC. You need to make sure that you do have a safe way for people to get around if they want to cycle. We can't have you know, bike lanes on every major street. We know that. I had an example in my community. I wasn't able to have it on, on Dufferin. I have the busiest bus route on Dufferin. We had to put it on a side street. But we need a safe way to get around. And then we need to deal with traffic. Things like extended construction hours so that areas that are, are having a lot of construction can happen quicker as well. Use of technology as well. Red light cameras connected to ticketing. And uh, as you said, make sure that uh, a ticket and tow is permanent and citywide. I think, you know, there's nothing more annoying Knowing that that person in the morning stopping to get their coffee is the most important thing <laughs> exactly. in the world. Right? Yeah. And and we need we need to be uh, uh, responsible and we need to get the city moving. So we need a series of actions. So there needs a it, it's it's a series of steps that need to be taken in order to get the city moving. All right, thank you, Anna Bailao. Um, we're going to move to another yes or no question. Um, and you all have, you know people in this situation, a lot of Torontonians who don't have backyards or balconies, no outdoor space where they live. So they head to our beautiful parks. Uh, as mayor, I'd like to ask each of you, would you make it legal to have an alcoholic drink in city parks? Yes or no, and you each have 20 seconds to quickly tell us why. Mitzi Hunter, we'll start with you and we'll go around the table. Well, yes, yeah, so I believe Torontonians are responsible. And I'm adding 17 acres of parks as part of my plan to fix the six. And so th I believe that we need to make sure that our parks are also better locally managed. And I want to see that happen so that we actually have beautiful, clean parks. I'm going to be opening up water fountains uh, faster, make sure they're maintained and th that the washrooms are also properly maintained. That has to come. If you're going to open up the parks for that type of, uh, you know, drinking responsibly, you make sure that the services and the supports and the cleaning and the management of those parks are happening. And under my plan, that Thank will, you, Mitzi. will be done. All right, quickly, we're, we've got to race through because we've got to finish up here. Josh Mallow, yes or no? You're, uh, yes, uh, everyone knows that. And uh, I, I, I've initiated this proposal because uh, it is an equity issue. Many Torontonians don't have backyards. And the reality is many of the, the things that I think people fear about this uh, allowance, just to have allow responsible adults to have a drink together in a park, whether it be a picnic or on a bench, comes from the existing issues, right? They're, they're concerned about, you know, uh, behavior. That's not going to change. But if you look at cities around the world and here in Canada that already allow it, Quickly, anarchy Josh. hasn't broken loose. Uh, there's no chaos. People Thank are, you. are being responsible. Okay, Anna Bailao, yes or no? And got, we got to stick to our 20 seconds because we, we want to wrap allow, up. We need to allow people that do it responsibly, but ensure that when that comes in, we have the enforcement for those that do not act responsible to act on it immediately. Thank you, Anna Bailao. Mark Saunders, to Sure. You. Uh, I would pilot it and make sure it's measured properly and just to look for those unintended consequences. But I do believe that the greater good will uh, win at the end of the day. But I just want to take that extra layer of caution before the full yes to that. Thank you, Mark. All right, Olivia, yes or no? Yes, but it has to be neighborly, including uh, washrooms, garbage, Absolutely. noise, all of those things needs to be obeyed. So it it's about behavior, neighbors. right? It's not yes, the, behavior, yeah, but, just the behavior. But there needs to be washroom that's open, Thank too. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Thank you all, candidates, for that. Um, we're going to move on to a question that maybe you yeah. haven't answered already um, in all of your debates. What is one policy from your rival, any one of them, that you like? So we're going to try to do this in uh, reverse alphabetical order by last name. So we're going to start with the, the last in the alphabet uh, at this table, Mark Saunders. That would be you. I'm trying really hard um, on something that I would like. You know what? No, no. Listen, I, listen I, I like the concept. I think everyone wants to do the best for the entire city. And I like the concepts. And we all have the same concepts, but certainly different approaches. So. Um, Finding one, I, I, I don't know. I haven't really done a deep dive and really put a lot of gravity into looking at everything that I was going to agree with. Anything jump out at you that you heard that was like, oh, not bad? Anything with regards to public safety has been not bad. All right. Thank you. Uh, Josh Batlow. 
Well, given that a number of the candidates have actually been announcing uh, many of the items on my platform, I like a lot of it, uh, obviously. And, uh, you know, good ideas should be good ideas, and we should be implementing them uh, at City Hall. Uh, so, um, like, for example, um, I think, you know, many of us agree that we need to open up libraries and schools after hours. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because we've got these public buildings that we could better utilize to serve, whether it be seniors, families, youth, and offer programming when we already have these public buildings and you know, many of them are in the heart of our communities. So there are many, many ideas that I think that regardless, you know, in all candor, all, wherever they came from, we need to act on them if they're a good idea. All right, thank you, Josh. Mitzi Hunter, how about you? Well, actually, I was going to say that, Josh, in terms of uh, after school, because as the former Minister of Education, I, of course, want to see all of our um, assets that we have in our city available for community use of schools and public libraries. So you've already said that. So I will actually say uh, Olivia's um, expansion of the community response uh, for well-being and wellness response is really important. I've seen that in my own community in Scarborough. Uh, Taibu Community Health Center has uh, done a wonderful job. Instead of the police responding, you're actually having uh, trained individuals uh, respond to mental health uh, and wellness uh, calls. And I believe that that is something that should be fully funded and expanded. And I do have a mental health strategy, and Thank I'm going to adopt Mitzi. that as part of it. And well, well, let's hand it off over to you, then Olivia Chow. I support Josh and Mitzi's. Uh, bringing City Hall back to build affordable housing. It's a great idea um, and because people are desperately waiting for it. Um, and Missy's um, expanding the uh, student nutrition programs because I started working on it in 1985. Uh, and I have the, that program and it's just grown tremendously, but we can do so much more together. So I, I love that plan. All right. Anna Bailao, you get the last word on this one. Thank you. Well, it's not that I agree, because I don't agree that more taxes and more bureaucracy are going to get us more housing, and especially affordable housing, but the fact that everybody is talking about housing, um, it's for me, it, 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 it means a lot. I've, I've been talking about this issue for a long time when we couldn't get a headline, a media headline, about the issue. And, uh, and to now have all the candidates running and having plans and putting forward uh, uh, their own ideas. Uh, I ap really appreciate that. All right. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for that. Now we're, uh, we're, we're approaching close to the end, so I want to make sure you get full time and full opportunity for this very last segment, which is your opportunity, each of you, to pitch your vision for the City of Toronto. You're each going to have one minute and 30 seconds. This is the longest allowable time uh, in our debate so far um, to make your final pitch to our audience and to the city of Toronto. And we're going to switch it around. We are going to go in alphabetical order. So we ended off with you, Anna Bailao. We will begin this segment with you now, a minute 30. Thank final you. pitch. Well, uh, I'm, I'm running to be the mayor of Toronto with a plan to fix services and build housing and make life easier and more affordable. Um, I came to this country when I was 15, year old, uh, 15 years, and my parents had already been here for a little while, and uh, they were able to buy a house within a couple of years of us getting here. We felt that sense of opportunity. And I want to make sure that every 15-year-old, doesn't matter if they're arriving today, doesn't matter if they've lived here all their life, feels that sense of opportunity. And that's why my plan will build housing. 285,000 units of housing and 57,000 of uh, purpose-built rental will bring senior services to their door so they can stay in their home. So that, uh, you know, we don't, we're not pushing our youth, we're not pushing out our workers, we're not pushing out our seniors, that we fix uh, services like the TTC. You know, on June 26, residents will have a very clear choice. They can have, you know, Olivia Chow, that will increase taxes. We know she's ready to tax. We don't know by how much, but she'll increase tax. Um, you know, they can have other candidates that uh, it's the same thing as electing Doug Ford as the premier and the, the, the mayor of the city of Toronto, or they can have me. Uh, I will be ready on day one. I have the experience. I have the track record of bringing billions uh, to the city of Toronto, of bringing council together uh, to deliver for the city, council, labour, uh, uh, business, which is what we need to get a fair deal for this city and to make sure that this continues to be a city of opportunity. Anna Bailao, thank you. Olivia Chow, it's your floor. Uh, like many of you, my family and I 
came to Canada uh, when I was 13. But my dad had a mental health issues, couldn't work. Uh, and my mom, with one income as a hotel maid, were able to feed the family and also pay a rent. Life is so much more difficult now. That's close to impossible with one small income. So we need to work to do much better. Seniors being told to wait for senior services, renters told to wait for affordable housing, riders, TDC riders told to um, wait for the bus and families waiting for childcare. The old way just doesn't work. We can't wait any longer. Let's come together. If we believe, if we take action, we can together build a city that's more caring, more affordable, safer, where everyone feels belong. Let's do this together because yes, we can do it. Olivia Chow, thank you. Mitzi Hunter, over to you now. You know, my family and I, we immigrated to Canada from Jamaica. And, you know, there's always that, that dream of, of being here. And my parents used to always say that door is through education. Well, I chose my university based on access to public transit. It was taking the Ellesmere bus to UTSC. And, you know, I want to make sure that the Toronto that we want, that we all want. There's been a lot of bickering here today, but who's fighting for our city? I'm fighting for the people of this city. I want to make sure that we have a city where everyone feels that they belong, where we have a city that is, is livable and that we have transit, for instance, the TTC waking up at 5.30 a.m. so that shift workers can get on that system, like my mom used to take on her way to work. Then making sure that we have affordability. Young people who grow up here can afford to live in this city. <clears throat> I want to make sure that we build neighborhoods and communities with parks, with playgrounds, with mental health supports, and making sure that our creative workers have a space to live. This city is our city, but we can't take it for granted. I want to make sure that I fight for our city, that I have a vision and I have the actual plan that is available that you can look at. So when you vote for me as your mayor, you know exactly what you're going to be getting. I have the passion. I have the experience. Let's work together to fix the six so that we have a city that works for everyone everywhere. Thank you, Mitzi Hunter. Josh Matlow, your vision for Toronto, minute 30. I'm asking for your confidence to be the mayor of this city. I am frustrated and I am done with all these promises that have been made to actually fix the services that have been declining for far too many years, to ensure that we have a more affordable city and to ensure that we have a city that is safe in a real and meaningful way where we invest in our communities and into our youth. I've been fighting for this city for years. Every single day I have been here ensuring that we have an age-friendly city where seniors are respected and that our city is designed to be more accessible and caring. I've been fighting to make sure that we address congestion, to expand and improve transit, including in Scarborough with the Eglinton East LRT and extending Shepherd to Nielsen. I want to have the SRT when it comes down having a rapid bus to make sure that over the next few years of construction, the Scarborough residents have a direct and rapid way to get to where they need to go. I want to make sure that our waterfront is protected in public. I'm going to be taking a stand when Doug Ford privatizes or he wants to privatize our waterfront for a private Austrian spa, move the Science Centre away from Flemington Park and Thorncliffe Park residents, and sell off our green belt that should be a gift to our kids rather than a gift to whoever went to his last stag and doe. I'm going to be taking a stand for Toronto, and I have the experience, the knowledge, and the ability to do so. But I'm the only one here who doesn't have a big party machine behind me or Doug Ford behind him to be able to represent you and only you as your mayor. Thank you so much, Josh Matlow. That means, final word, candidate Mark Saunders. Thank you. And first, I just want to congratulate the Bradfords to their addition, Bronwyn, to the family. Yeah, and sorry I couldn't great. be here. Congrats. So, listen, I have uh, come here. My parents came here in 1967 for better education for the six kids that they have. And now I'm here running for mayor in a city that I love. I spent 38 years of public service putting my life on the line for complete strangers because it was a calling. 
And over those 38 years, I learned a lot about people navigating right across the entire city, dealing with problems at its most local levels, dealing with people through situations. Good government creates the environment for great communities. And I've seen over the years that city government has not done that. They've followed the special needs folks and the special interest folks and not really taken the time to listen to what the issues are. I'm running for mayor because I have kids and I'm interested in their success. I'm interested in your kids' success. And it is about making sure that we spend properly. You know, I've listened to Olivia Chow. She's too afraid to tell you what the taxes are going to be because if she does, she will not win. Businesses need certainty, especially small businesses. And they are very afraid right now if they're going to be subjected to Olivia Chow's taxes. When it comes to public safety, the police are not the all-encompassing, but they play a key and important factor. Olivia Chow does not like the Toronto Police Service. She's made it clear. Vote for me on June 26 for a healthy and safe city. Thank you. Thank you, Mark Saunders, and thank you to all of our candidates. Thank you for your passionate thank civic you. engagement. I uh, appreciate you being here today. Thank of course, you. we're going to have daily coverage of this by-election on our website, cbc.ca slash Toronto. Advanced voting runs from June 8th to 13th. Polling stations will be open from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. So make sure if you can't get out on voting day, do advanced voting. Voting day is June 26th. Take care, everyone. Thank you for joining us.